thanks, Marie. And, and uh, certainly to um, Tim and Rachel, it's a real privilege to share this um, session with you. Um, and as Rachel said, um, she's doing the old 20th century way. Um, I'd love to have a chance to interact, but let me dive straight in. Um, a lot of what uh, Tim and Rachel said, I think I'm going to try and build on with that specific focus on what is the role of the private sector. Um, so I'm trying to scroll down now. Um, do, I, do I have to control it or do you, can you control it? Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to really start off just giving a very brief historical review before diving into the specifics. And anybody who has not read this extraordinary book on the changing body, which uh, takes an economic and nutritional perspective over the last 300 years, would really enjoy the uh, very thorough view that comes out of it, showing that over the course of the last 300 years, a combination of private and public actions have led to steady improvements in human well-being. Um, and you'll notice as well from one of the graphics that body mass index uh, started climbing from the 1870s, uh, in this case um, from some uh, U.S. data sets. Um, we tend to come in and look at these things only over the last few decades. The point they make in the book, that it's really been the drivers of improved nutrition and nutrition access that have led to economic growth, that themselves have fueled intergenerational improvements, that have themselves then started to spur greater intellectual and social involvement of communities worldwide. Of course, towards the end of the book, they make the point that we are now at risk of overshooting uh, in terms of having body mass indexes that are not going to give us increased gains in terms of human health and productivity. Um, we take our work uh, in, inside PepsiCo, and I think the private sector as well, is looking more broadly at the kind of conclusions that came out of the recent Foresight report on the future in food and farming from the UK. Um, like uh, many of the other Foresight reports, we believe that this is a solid piece of science-based work that really highlighted many of the linkages that we face in the crisis in, um, what we face in terms of agriculture and food systems. The conclusions, I think, speak very well to many of the issues we're speaking about here. The need to balance future demand and supply um, is a direct um, uh, example of the kind of thing Tim Lang was saying earlier, that we have to focus on consumer demand among the wealthy as much as meeting the needs of the poorest. If we're not going to address the level of demands that are rising in China and our emerging economies and have risen very fast in the West, we know that we're going to have enormous strains on our food supplies. I won't go into the stability of the food supply, but jump straight down to the bottom to remind us as well that the last two conclusions relate to the critical need to structure the way we actually go about our work, whether it's in the private or the public sector, with a deep awareness of the uh, intergenerational and ecosystem implications. Um, when I say private companies, um, I refer here to all of those involved in the value chain, from those involved in agriculture, uh, through processing, packaging, retail, food and service. And just to give you an example of how complex this can be, um, this is from a, a recent paper we produced, which asked the question, how important in the packaged food area are the major multinationals uh, around the world? And without looking into the graphics, and we can send you the, the details, it makes the point that probably between 10 and 12% of the packaged food sold in most of the emerging markets comes from the top 10 multinationals, meaning that 88% does not. And that includes the vast street food grouping as well as the informal sector. The point of putting this up uh, is not to say that we are a small part of any solution, but to show that we have a very strategic role in a multinational to try and bring on board the smaller and medium enterprises and think a lot more clearly about how we're going to address the vast street food and informal sector because it's what's being consumed in total and not just from one company or another that really matters from a population perspective. We have seen three groupings of industry actions over the last couple of years and I've been privileged to be sitting at the table when these have been evolving. Um, 
the first thing that struck me was that in most of these discussions and uh, the policy development efforts, the concern of population health has been uppermost in the minds of CEOs or the leaders in industry. And that's often difficult for people in the public sector to appreciate, where they, where they would often say, the only thing on the table is profit. Well, I think that may be a case, and it certainly is important, because without profit, we can't make any of the changes. But I think any of you coming into some of the strategic discussion meetings on food security, led by 12 CEOs over the last few months, would have been impressed to see the close links between their approaches and those of the public sector. And I know many from IFBRI have actually been in those meetings. Um, clearly, the CEOs and the private sector is as concerned about the implications of rising food prices, the vulnerability of the food supply, as are increasingly those involved in foreign policy. An outcome of their work um, just a couple of weeks ago was for these 12 CEOs, um, led by Paul Pullman from Unilever, and I'm pleased to say including our CEO, and 10 others from companies not just in the food uh, manufacturing sector, but also those in agro, um, and um, even in those involved in the insurance and reinsurance business like Swiss Re, all focused on what is it that the private sector can do to address food security. They highlighted that none of these actions can be done alone, uh, clearly, we need to increase investments in food value chains, and they're going to a number of specific activities, and highlight the work that the World Economic Forum has been doing around the new vision for agriculture in a number of countries that are named on the screen. They stress the importance of functioning agricultural markets and highlight the fact that the farmer, the smallholder farmer of the future, who's going to be successful, is also going to be an entrepreneurial woman by and large. And how can you provide the right support so that you'd be able to have access to markets and would also have access to some of the technologies needed to boost productivity? And that's stressed particularly in point three. Very importantly, built into these recommendations was the importance of environmental sustainability. And you will see later how the companies, and certainly we, are starting to incorporate this as a core part of our business practices right across the value chain. And finally... Um, the point I think that Rachel and um, Tim made very well. This last point cannot be left and thought of it trivially. A major shift to improved nutrition should be undertaken. Remember that the context of this was originally around agricultural issues and commodity prices and price volatility. This is signaling the equivalent of what the Foresight Report came up about, focusing on consumer demand, that we need to make sure that the output of agriculture primarily and initially meets the nutrition needs both of the poorest and of the wealthiest in a way in which can be done sustainably. Um, we've seen that many of these points have been echoed by the recent Oxfam report, Growing a Better Future, particularly those highlighting the importance of ensuring that agribusinesses um, address um, the issues across the value chain and also advocating for major companies to invest in sustainable, resilient smallholder agriculture. And I can see what is starting to emerge more and more as being the demand of consumers um, to know at the point of consumption, they want to know where was the food grown, how was it grown, what were the environmental and labor conditions. All of these increased demands are starting to create a very different value chain than we've had in the past. Clearly, the role of the, um, the private sector with the public sector even in addressing the granaries is important, and I just happened to have this up fortuitously and was thrilled to hear Tim Lang's reference to Boyd Orr when he came in as the head of FAO. One of his first goals was to establish a series of public uh, granaries and food supply reserves around the world, and now many years later we're starting to recognize just how important it is to have this um, in some strategic parts of the world. As an individual company, um, we have tried to define for ourselves what does it mean to address undernutrition, and I'm not going to go into all of these, but it's one thing to say them. We found that it's another thing to take each one of these steps and implement them in terms of programmatic actions with normal uh, funding coming from the corporation and not seeing these as corporate social responsibility initiatives. One example of the investments of the last few years 
has been, for example, to start addressing iron deficiency, but using the best that we know about in terms of uh, consumer insights, uh, the um, knowledge and awareness of, in this case, young women and girls in India, and developing a product line that would be trusted by consumers and simultaneously address this huge intractable problem of iron deficiency in India that has persisted for centuries. Simultaneously, we recognize that some people are beyond the market, and that's why we need to partner with groups like Valid International to be addressing and providing the kind of nutrition support needed in emergencies that unfortunately will continue to play out. Um, I mentioned uh, the famine, and while it's so easy to focus um, often on the long term without putting the investment there, we are trying to put this in context of saying, yes, we're willing and we have to do a lot of work immediately because people are dying as we speak in the Horn of Africa. But while we do that, we need to make sure that we put in place the programs that will start building the agricultural base for a sustainable source of foods to be available and used locally. And that's why you'll see down on the longer-term action um, our first efforts in Ethiopia to start trying to build a partnership with the local farmers based upon a chickpea-based approach to start growing the solutions uh, to having a sustainable source of food available locally should there be famines in future, which unfortunately we'll probably see for many years to come. In terms of chronic diseases, we see that, as again, as with undernutrition, we see this as a natural part of our work. It's the part which we obviously get the greatest uh, pressure from to change, and clearly that does have an impact. We're aware, as Rachel pointed out, the data showing compellingly that the, the largest, uh, one of the largest single contributors to many of the risk factors are nutrition-related. And without going into it in the way she did, I can give you a sense of how we respond to a table like this. We see blood pressure equals for us salt reduction as well as stronger efforts on obesity. Um, we see the cholesterol means shifting the type and the amount of fats, particularly saturated fats, and ideally increasing also some of the healthier fats and oils into our supply. We know that the issue of underweight um, I addressed through a range of issues. Fruit and vegetable intake we know requires us to think about how we can bring more fruits and vegetables um, to consumers in a format that will not, in our case, likely to be fresh, but it will probably be something as close as we can to natural. And that, again, is an open debate we need to have with the nutrition and the um, public policy community about how, what is the closest to natural we can get without being in, the, in a fresh state. And I'll give a reason why. Um, we know at this point, as we head into the summit, that certainly smoking salt carbs are all in the dock and facing the dock. And due to this and many other pressures, um, we've been able to take certain actions. But before mentioning it, Rachel stressed the economic costs. I think one of the economic arguments that uh, really keeps a lot of us concerned um, isn't given enough attention. And that's the reality that was spelt out by Peter Heller when he was still at the IMF. Um, eight or nine years ago, and colleagues um, at Oxford who'd looked at European pensions and made the same point that, remember this point was made eight years ago, as we start seeing economic growth slow in the OECD countries, and as we see it hopefully staying high in the emerging economies, the productivity of the workforce in the developing countries is going to become even more important to the survival of the pensions and the social security systems of the OECD countries. Any drop in their productivity, which could happen due to chronic diseases, and we see is happening, will have very important uh, economic consequences. I raise this because this is a, a macroeconomic argument that I hope in discussion we can take up and raises very important reasons for why it is in the West's interest to be actually supporting some of the programs aimed at NCD prevention. The World Economic Forum, as in the case of undernutrition, has played a very important role in bringing together a range of private sector partners who have come up with a list of activities that we can put on the table for the high-level meeting. Basically, they include um, the role of the private sector as an employer um, and focused on a range of workplace wellness programs, the role of the private sector in providing a range of goods and services, Clearly, we provide foods and beverages. They need to be of the highest nutrition standards, and they need to be marketed in ways that are responsible. 
the pharmaceutical and the medical devices industry bring their own sets of issues, as do the um, physical activity groups and those involved in sports. This has had an enormously important role in, for the first time, bringing together diverse private sector entities around a very sharp focus on what can they do to promote NCD prevention. And when it started over a year ago, it looked as if there was nothing in common that we could achieve. But here we are now, a couple of weeks away, and I believe that one of the important enduring outcomes of the high-level meeting is a better spirit of collaboration and the potential that the private sector can have on NCD prevention and control that never existed a year ago. Um, in the food and beverage industry, we have made a number of pledges. Um, not all of them are fully implemented. They're all in different stages of implementation. Remember that these pledges were made to the World Health Organization. The problem with them is that for us to succeed, we need detailed specifications and we need a partner in country and at the global level to actually work with us to define whether success is being achieved, whether we're doing the right thing. Only in the case of marketing have we had the uptake on these commitments from the World Health Organization. And we hope following the UN high-level meeting, we would have a similar response to the food reformulation offers, which particularly focus on salt, and many of the others related to labeling, physical activity, and so on. Within our own company, and we know that certainly within Unilever and to some extent General Mills and others, a range of commitments have been made that relate to chronic diseases, and I'm not going to go through all of these. Just to highlight a couple, you'll see there's some which involve reducing nutrients, and of course, um, Rachel correctly pointed out that that is not going to be the only way we're going to achieve nutrition improvements, but certainly sodium levels remain too high worldwide, um, as do the type of sat saturated fat. Um, we realize and uh, will be going even further in terms of what we're hoping to do in supporting small and medium enterprises to lower sodium. But similarly, on the saturated fat, we think there's an enormous agro opportunity to think about what are the alternatives to palm oil on a worldwide basis? How can we build the scale of interest to shift permanently out of palm oil, which is not a heart-healthy oil, and certainly an environmentally damaging oil that really needs to, be, uh, needs to happen over the short to medium term. All the other alternatives that we have at this stage, while having heart positive effects, tend to, not, uh, tend to have a larger footprint in terms of um, their land use and the amount of water that they'd need to consume. Some of the others you may not be aware of um, are, are of interest and we're acting on. Um, Tim will be hopefully pleased to know that we continue to improve our marketing to children. And by the end of this year, we hope that we will have stopped the direct sale of full sugar soft drinks in primary, secondary schools around the globe. Um, do these things make a difference? Well, we certainly know in the U.S. Uh, that between the uh, top uh, beverage companies, um, withdrawing the beverages from U.S. schools and changing the portfolio has taken 88% of the calories consumed in the schools out of them. And we suspect this will translate in time into uh, slowing the epidemic of obesity. Doing the tougher thing, saying that we're going to reduce by a set amount of calories the amount of food put on the table in the U.S., um, was a very bold effort, now being independently assessed by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and uh, the head of the uh, advisory committee, Barry Popkin, I think many would know as not being somebody who's going to um, allow uh, um, industry to adversely influence the outcome. This has been taken very seriously now by 16 or 17 of the companies who made the initial pledge and almost 100 have come on board. Um, we are starting to increase our reformulation in many of the product lines we have. But I think the biggest changes will actually come when we start increasing a whole new set of lines of fruit, vegetable, nuts, and grains, and I'll come back to them in a second. Just to give you one, one snippet of what it means to make a pledge, remember that when a company goes public with a comment that we will lower sodium by a certain percent, um, our legal team come after us and say, how precisely are you going to measure it? In what particular brand? What is your run rate by country? Um, how are you going to make it so that you get into the green by the, by the target date of this case of 2015. And here's an example of how well we're doing in a couple of countries, and you can see we 
sort of on target for most. We've got to do a lot more work in Canada. This is, this, these kind of graphics then go back into the business, not just the research and development teams, but those involved in marketing, sales, um, and have enormous implications, not just to the way they do their business, but also to their own remuneration. The big hope, of course, is that we'll be able to shift um, increasingly to a company which is called the Global Nutrition Group that will be based increasingly on fruits, vegetables, nuts, and grains. It's early days. We've only been going now on this for six months. Um, signs are relatively positive. But we know that every step forward is often met with potential to push us back. So as we are starting to make progress and describe our R&D efforts recently in the New Yorker, um, we will have critics, for example, in the BMJ, saying that the industry is trying to derail the UN summit. And perhaps worse from a company point of view, every time one tries to make changes towards nutrition, one of the biggest threats is that consumer demand may simply not be there or may not be responding adequately, and whole lines of investment um, have got to fail before we eventually succeed. Um, one of the goals as well, we believe very importantly of industry, is to put better research and development on the table. And again, I think we're pleased that the support given for large-scale community interventions are starting to provide us with better ways of tapping the complexity of NCDs in a number of the cities of the world. The third area really um, ends off by saying that all of this is very well, but if we're truly going to build these links in an intimate way between what we eat and what we grow, we need to take a value chain perspective exactly along the lines that Rachel mentioned. Um, we have started to structure our work in a number of African settings along the way and see the potential for us to be providing increased value to the farmer, to the local consumer, to the, um, uh, the local companies as well by taking this route. An analysis like this has opened up the opportunities for how we, how we might be working better, whether it's in potatoes or whether it's in chickpeas or whether it's in some of the fruit and vegetable areas. And hopefully in discussion, we'll get into the implications of thinking in terms of the value chain uh, for the way in which we're going to link what gets grown to what gets eaten. Very importantly, in thinking about this, two recent reports by the Food and Agriculture Organization that highlighted the enormous amount of global food losses on the one hand and the potential for using appropriate food packaging solutions on the other are exactly within the um, bullseye of what food companies together with those involved in packaging, could be doing far better. The two reports between them show the devastating losses that occur, and the losses are not just in terms of the food, but they're also in terms of the lost use of agricultural land, something Tim made a, mentioned very strongly. We believe that deeper engagement in the food waste and the food packaging area is one that needs to be put on the table as an area ripe for serious public-private interaction. Um, if we do this, it will be a small contributor to starting to do what Jason Clay from the World Wide Fund called for in terms of freezing the footprint of food, which has to be one of our common goals. Internally, before ending, we have started acknowledging the importance of building sustainable agricultural practices. I've been privileged to have a CEO who's actually gone ahead and forced me to change my own focus from coming in with a health public health and medical background to now seeing the link and being uh, changing it to including agriculture, where the key word in my terms of reference are the and, health and agriculture, has proved to be challenging, but also incredibly exciting, because suddenly I find in my company um, a group of farmers, agroeconomists, those involved in agro-research, who are deeply passionate about their work, but are often not asked about solutions to address practical nutritional problems. Once we started doing that, we found that within our own company, we have some practices, whether they are biofortification advances happening with colleagues um, in Harvest Plus in parts of Latin America, or they better tillage practices on some of our potato farms in remote parts of China, um, and so on. Derek, um, would you be able to conclude soon? We're running out of time. We started yeah. late. I'm afraid we would like to have I'm time for a few questions. Yeah, I'm about to conclude. Okay, thank you. 
um, before ending, I, I, the one area where I might disagree with Rachel um, relates to the whole issue of subsidies, um, and I'm sure we will discuss it. It's certainly my view, and I, I would imagine it was also Tim's when he wrote a very important review of the public health aspects of the European Union common agricultural policy, or an, a similar equivalent report done by the Better Produce Foundation, that subsidies do tend to have a negative impact on the growth of fruit and vegetable consumption uh, in many ways, and we can go into them. They also tend to have negative impacts in terms of excess dairy exports. Um, and basically, I think the biggest concern is that the way we place our subsidies distorts um, the overall food plate away from the diet that we hope we would have to one that tends to be focused mainly on livestock, meat, and a range of oils. So in summary, I'm not going to go, go through this. There are a number of defined actions we can take, and I would hope we could focus on some of the gaps remaining. But I would remind you, uh, end off with uh, Tim's point, uh, and here you have a, an example of consumer marketing uh, to make the point that unless we think about the consumer um, in the same way as we've spent so much time thinking about the farmer and how we link their desires and passions to those of farmers as well, I don't know that we're going to make the progress that we need. Thank you.